Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, we're continuing in the study of the book of Acts. And today, we're going to uh, begin with chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, before I get started, though, let me ask Brother uh, Joe to say hi to everybody. Uh, this is Joe with the Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, I do hope you'll sub uh, if you like uh, fellowship and learning, and uh, that's about it. Really looking forward to Chapter 7. This, I know Luke said Chapter 2 was uh, probably the highlight in the Chapter 2, but this is uh, Stephen. This is, this is going to be a great chapter. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, chapter two is a highlight. There's so many good things in, in this whole book of Acts. Uh, it, it's really a, a record, of a historical record of the first 30 years of Christianity. So um, there's a lot in there. Uh, but this particular chapter, I would say that if, if someone want, wanted to um, read only one chapter and, and learn about the history of Judaism, uh, this is probably be the, the chapter that kind of sums it up the best. Stephen gives a sermon that is uh, a, a, just a, a just a historical uh, outline of uh, uh, the history of you know from Abraham all the way to their present time. So let's let's begin. Uh, Acts chapter seven verse one in the KJV. Then said the high priest. Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charan, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. All right, brother, what are you say about that. We're, we'll go through it very uh, carefully. Well, I, I think maybe uh, it'd be a, a good idea if uh, when it's your turn again, uh, you you go over just a little bit of uh, what chapter six was, was about and where we're at here. Uh, I believe this is Stephen being brought before the council. A uh, little bit of historical stuff here um, appears to be a uh, uh, the beginning of the address of Stephen. I'm, I'm a little lost. Is this uh, is this Stephen starting to address the council? I guess it is. But I should be a little bit better prepared. Uh, I'm just going to throw it back to you, Luke. I'm just a little foggy here. All right. Yeah. I guess you're right. I I didn't really uh, say like uh, my normal speech as we we uh, begin this uh, series. I mean, begin each uh, session. In that, uh, I think this is the seventh or eighth uh, video. Uh, so far in the book of Acts, obviously we, we started with uh, the Acts chapter 1 verse 1 and we've been working our way through it. So we've already covered a lot of ground. Uh, there's probably, you know, uh, 10 hours of or more of content. Uh, so I, I hope everybody will go back and watch it from the beginning, but particularly uh, the, the, to get the context of this study today, the context of chapter 7. It is important for you to know then that uh, the apostles um, were um, made a decision. It's kind of like the decision Moses was faced with when he was overwhelmed with work, trying to do uh, like handle all of the administration of his his uh, theocracy there uh, by himself. Uh, and and uh, Aaron convinced him to pick men to help him. And, and this is the same kind of thing where the apostles are at the point where they cannot do everything like, you know, bussing the tables, you know, and, the, and serving the food and stuff. So they say that we need help. We need to our, have our schedule free so we can preach and pray. And uh, so they pick seven men that they uh, believe are suited for this, that are, uh, have the right uh, credentials, and they... And one of those seven is Stephen. Uh, Stephen, it, it'll turn out that he's going to be killed, and he will is is considered to be the first martyr, the first Christian to suffer death for his faith. Uh, so there is a lot of disagreement as to the time frame between Pentecost 
and the death of Stephen. Uh, some people think it was a matter of days and weeks. Other people think it was a matter of months and years. Uh, I'm inclined to think it's 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 a period of several years that, that transpires here. <clears throat> but that's another study that we can do some other time. The important thing to understand, though, is that uh, Peter has been accused of blasphemy, of blaspheming uh, Moses and, and uh, the law and, and uh and preaching Jesus, and so they, they're, I guess, I don't remember if this is in the temple or at the temple, I, I thought I thought this was outside of the temple, uh, but maybe we'll get more, uh, that'll become more clear as we go along. Uh, did I say, did I say Stephen, did I say something else? You said Peter, I know you meant Stephen. Oh, Peter, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, this is, this is Stephen, that is, uh, I'm, giving this sermon now, so I'm sorry. You know, I'm glad you said that, because, you know, I, I numerous times when I watch a video back, and I intend to say Paul, and I'll say Peter, or I'll say, well, I want to say Peter, and I'm saying James, and it, it, it actually, it, it totally reverses the whole point I'm trying to make, because I, I may name the wrong person, so it's just one of those mental lapses, and uh, thanks for catching that. So this is Stephen, is the, um, this entire chapter is Stephen's speech, his, uh, which is one of the greatest, uh, uh, as I said, it's a summary uh, from Abraham to the present time of, uh, of, of the Jews and Israel. Um, all right, brother, uh, before I continue. Uh, what well, what's, what's, so, what's so great about Stephen's speech here is it's uh, uh, basically a full history of the, the nation of Israel from its inception uh, with Abraham all the way to present and uh, through Christ. And uh, so, I mean, really, uh, if, you want a, if you want an abbreviated yet inspired history of the Jewish people, well, here you go. Uh, one chapter uh, speaks volumes and volumes and volumes. Josephus spent, forget how many volumes he made on the antiquities of the Jews. Stephen manages to, to narrow it down to a, a short uh, sermon here and in doing so, uh, ensures uh, that they hate him enough to kill him. And uh, uh, this is, like I said, an inspired by God. It says God breathed this through him uh, on what to say about the Jewish nation. So looking forward to hearing it read. Um, well, I'm going to... Uh uh, make a couple of distinctions here that it's just very, very common uh, m mistakes that people make as that um, uh, Jews did not exist and Judaism didn't exist until a much later time than Abraham. In fact, Israel didn't exist until a much later time than Abraham. But most people think the beginning of it was Abraham. In fact, uh, uh, when Abraham uh, started interacting with God and God selected him and, and, uh, and, and as the one to, through his genealogy, bring in the Messiah, uh, that the whole world will be blessed by the seed of Abraham. Uh, from that point uh, until you actually have Jews, uh, Judaism, and the state of Israel, it, it, it's, you know, much time passes. I don't know how many years or centuries, but a long time. Um, so uh, Abraham was not a Jew. Uh, he wasn't even an Israelite. Um, his his son, he, Abraham had Isaac, uh, and uh, he had Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael was the son that was not supposed to happen. Uh, Sarah and Abraham lost patience and lost faith in God's promise that they were going to have a, a child and Sarah's an old woman, almost a hundred, and uh, before she finally con conceives. But because they lost patience, Sarah convinced Abraham to have sex with his handmaiden and produce a child. So this child was Ishmael, and from Ishmael come the descendants of the Arab nations. So the Arabs and the Jewish state, they're, they're related, half-brothers. Then eventually, God's promise was fulfilled, and Abraham and Sarah, she conceived, and they had 
uh, Isaac. So he was the this chosen son uh, of Abraham. And now uh, Isaac was still was not a Jew, and he wasn't an Israelite. You got uh, then you had Isaac had Jacob and Esau. The same kind of a thing happened where uh, Esau, even though he was the firstborn among, among the two twins, uh, the one God wanted to be the, the, the genealogy that the Messiah would come through was um, uh, Isaac, not Esau. Now, I mean Jacob. Uh, so, so Jacob then later on had his name changed by God to Israel. So this is the first time we hear the word Israel. And then um, this land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants that God was sending Abraham off to go to, uh, that land wasn't even achieved until um, until after uh, the, all these fam the family ends up getting becoming slaves in Egypt and being uh, getting freed from Egypt because of Moses and then 40 years in the desert and then finally they get this promised land that is eventually becomes known as Israel uh, but so there were no Israelites until uh, Jacob had his name changed to Israel and his descendants were called the Israelites uh, and there were no Jews until uh, Judah, one of the 12 sons of um, uh, Jacob, who, who became Israel. Um, uh, one of his sons was named Judah, and that particular family line were known as the Jews. So to the correct understanding here is uh, uh, the, it takes a long, long time before you get Jews, Israelites, the state of Israel, Judaism, all these things. It, and this is going to... Much of this is going to be laid out in this chapter, I think. So I probably went into more detail than was necessary there, but I, I just wanted to correct some common misconceptions. It's a very simple thing that most people think Abraham was a Jew. All right, brother? No, I, I wrote in the sidebar that was an inspired mistake. Uh, actually, uh, I did that on purpose, Luke, to give you the opportunity to, uh, to do that teaching. I don't think a lot of people realize that, uh, me being one. <laughs> Back to you. Uh, okay, uh, now let's get back to the scriptures. Uh, I, I'll repeat the first two verses again. Then said the high priest, are these things so? He's speaking to uh, Stephen. And he said, and then this is Stephen speaking. Uh, Man, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. So this is the point in history where uh, Stephen is uh, picking up and beginning his uh, historical account of all these people and events. When he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charan, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I showed thee. Now the fact that he, Abraham had the faith to pick up and move his family to who knows where, because he believed God that he had this a place that he, he was sending him, and he trusted God. This was the first act of, of faith of, of Abraham that we ad, admire so much. Uh, and, but even though a lot of people think he's the, a man of perfect faith, but we know that he and his wife lost faith that at a certain point in the promise of conception uh, because Sarah got to be so old and she still was without a child. So because of their they, their faith was... They doubted God. They decided to take matters in their own hand and 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 uh, create a child through uh, the handmaiden. Uh, so he's a great man of faith, but he didn't have perfect faith. Now read chapter verse four it says, "Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charan. And from thence, when he his father was dead, he removed him into this land, uh, wherein ye now dwell." Um, I'm not sure who it's, uh, if Abraham, let me read this part in the Amplified. Maybe it'll identify these people a little bit better. Uh, now the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? And he answered, so it's correct that this is Stephen beginning his speech. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory, the Shekinah, the radiance of God, appeared unto our father Abraham when we, he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, 
after his father died, God sent him to this country in which you now live. Um, so it seems like this father that died is, is the father of uh, Abraham, if I've still got this straight here. Brother, what do you, you say now? Well, it's, it's highly pertinent in uh, today's news uh, because everyone's debating uh, who, who actually uh, is entitled to the land of Israel. And uh, so many people say, well, you know, the, the Jews are uh, newcomers or uh, it was promised to uh, Ishmael or, or however they want to argue it. But this is this goes way back to the beginning. I mean, God, they were taken to Egypt and they were scattered many times. But this establishes that God gave Jerusalem and the land around it to Abraham at the very beginning. So it establishes uh their country and uh, their people. Um, yeah, I, I think that is a very important point that very few people understand. the uh, The argument in the Middle East, uh, you know, the root of all of this, and, and it goes back to Abraham and these two sons. Um, the first son, see, the first son is supposed to get the inheritance, but the first son was conceived with the handmaiden. It was not God's intention. God's intention was for Abraham and Sarah to have a son. That was the line that he was going to bless. So because Abraham and Sarah took matters in their own hand and conceived Ishmael, even though he was the first son, he was not honored by God as the first son. And uh, he, he and Hagar, his mother, were exiled, and God did protect them. And from Ishmael, it says that he became a great nation or maybe even many nations but it's believed that Ishmael's descendants are the rest of the Middle East and and um, Isaac's descendants came the the Jewish people the Israelites uh, so here you have uh, the the well, let's call them just the it's rather than Arabs they're not all Arabs but let's just say the Muslim nations the Muslim nations in the Middle East uh, they feel that they're entitled to that land in Israel and, and you know because because the firstborn was Ishmael and he should have gotten uh, this uh, he was the one that was promised not uh, uh, Isaac uh, and so of course we know as we study the scriptures that God blessed Isaac's line not Ishmael's but there that this dispute over who deserves this land in the Middle East it can be traced back to these two half brothers, the the say the Muslim nations and uh, the nation of Israel. They, they come from half brothers, both claiming that they they're entitled to that land. So uh, before I go on any more, you want to say about that? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think it's kind of neat that uh, God established a plan even through people's mistakes. He he foreknew the mistakes we would make. And to, to be a Jew, uh, if you have a mother and a father, if the father's a Jew and the mother's and not and is not, uh, the child is not considered Jewish. But if the if the uh, uh, father is not Jewish and the mother is, then the child is considered part of the Jewish nation. And uh, this is kind of neat all through history, especially when Rahab, uh, the harlot, is brought into the line of the Messiah. And that uh, Mary, who uh, no new man, knew no man, uh, conceived and gave birth to to the Messiah. All of this is through the through the woman, and it, it started out because Abraham uh, didn't have faith, and and uh, and uh, uh, he, and when he was when the firstborn was with a handmaiden, God says, "No, that's not the line. The firstborn is with with Sarah." And uh, that is the line, and that continued all the way down to uh, Christ. Back to you, Luke. All right. So, uh, yeah, so Abraham, uh, he, he, there's a lot of examples of this great faith of Abraham. Even It wasn't perfect, but it was great. First of all, he was willing to move to a new place and relocate his family on, on faith. All right. So uh, continue on. It's, uh, this is... Uh, uh, verse five, and and oh, verse five, uh, and he gave him none inheritance in it, 
No, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give, give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in strange land, in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Uh, so this not only happened, but uh, you know, God prophesied that all these things would happen here. So verse five and six, your thoughts, I'll read it in the Amplified after you're done and maybe we'll get more insights too. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't have any notable insights at this point, Luke. Um, just back to you. Okay, let me read it in the Amplified, the same verse five and six. It says, but he, but he, and it's capitalized here, so uh, they're, they're, by capitalizing it, they're saying this he is God speaking, but he did not give him inheritable property, not even enough ground to take a step on, yet he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. And this is, in effect, what God spoke to him, uh, that his descendants would be aliens and his strangers in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Of course, that's referencing the 400 years they were in slavery uh, in uh, Egypt. Um, and of course, that's, um, that's the first they went to, to Egypt and they were blessed because the Pharaoh and um, um, Joseph Joseph was one of these 12 sons of uh, uh, Israel. Uh, Jake, when I say Jacob, Israel, it's like, let's say Israel is his last name because his name was Jacob, but God changed his name to Israel. So let's call him Jacob, Israel. And, uh, and, and he, his 12 sons, one of them was Joseph, who this story goes, it's a fascinating story. I mean, Joseph is one of the most amazing characters in the Bible, but uh, he was uh, sold into slavery by his brothers who were jealous, but he ends up in Egypt and ends up advancing in the government to be the right-hand man to the Pharaoh. And, and because of that position, when the, the starvation hit the land, um, his father, uh, uh, Joseph's father and all his family, all his brothers and family, they were able to come there and be taken care of um, uh, and spared from this uh, famine. They hit the land. But after the, the, the uh, Joseph died and, and, uh, and maybe a couple of generations, several generations went by and he had the new Pharaoh, he didn't care much for the Jews. They were multiplying so much and growing to great population and, and being very successful. And it, it, it scared the Pharaoh, so he decided to make them slaves. <laughs> so first they were blessed going into Egypt, then they were enslaved, and that's why it was necessary for Moses to say, let my people go. Um, so now let's, uh, let me see. I don't remember if I was supposed to call on you yet. Let me see. I did five and six, I think. Let's go to verse seven in the KJV. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that, shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Um, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. So we've already referenced all these people and, and the, the, the time frame. So we're, we've jumped ahead quite a bit in our conversation. Okay, so that's all the way through verse 8. Brother, what do you say about all that? Well, I was, uh, I was unaware, uh, my mind wasn't grasping that that was referring to the 400 years of bondage in Egypt. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, this is a Bible study for me, uh, not so much a teaching. Uh, Luke's the teacher. But, uh, yeah, now that makes sense. It sounds like uh, when Joseph's family has, uh, joined him in Egypt, uh, uh, Jerusalem or the Israel area was without a presence uh, by them. And so uh, I remember when they finally got back, they had to win it back through war. So, yeah, very, very interesting. And, and evidently... Uh, 
12 patriarchs. Is that 12 generations before they made it back? Uh, no, the 12 patriarchs would be the 12 sons of uh, Jacob Israel. Got it, got it. Okay, so um, now let's read further. Uh, verse 9, And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. And he delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. I think I need to be more careful in trying explaining too much because when I end up expounding and then I'm realizing that, you know, this is what uh, Joseph's doing in his speech. He's, he's expounding. So I, I might be just jumping ahead a little bit in my enthusiasm. Um, and, all right. So through verse 10, what do you say about that? Well, I, I'm glad you expounded because I <clears throat> I was uh, not following uh, as well as I, I should have, and so your your uh, expose uh, helped me greatly. Um, yeah, it sounds like uh, he's he's just giving a, a a very good history of the of the people. So um, back to you, I guess. Okay. So. Uh... Now, verse 11. Um, now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent uh, out our fathers first. And, and at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Um, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and 15 souls. Um, I, it might be a good idea now for me to recommend one of my playlists or studies I've done in the past. I did a whole bunch of what in, in Bible study you refer to as character studies. You have um, sub, subjects, study of a subject matter. You have study of... of personal uh, characters in the Bible, significant characters. Uh, and then you have um, verse by verse study as we're doing here, going verse, a few verses at a time, working our way through the book. These are basically the three ways that you, uh, you do study this uh, biblical theology. But I, I went through, starting with uh, Adam and Eve, and then to, I think it was Satan, uh, and then I think it was... Uh, I don't know. We worked our all the way through through uh, through Noah and uh, all the way through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and uh, did discuss did a thorough study on Joseph. So, if you want to go look at those character studies, where we're going to great depth discussing these individuals and their lives and and uh, how they fit into all this, uh, the one on Joseph is what we're he's he's referencing it now. But this is a couple of sentences. And the study on Joseph probably took me, you know, uh, you know, four or five, six, seven hours to to cover Joseph. He's such an important character. Um, all right. Uh, anything to comments there? Yeah, I, I just know that uh, you know, uh, from my my general knowledge, uh, you have specific knowledge. Mine's quite general. That uh, that Joseph was a type of Christ. Uh, uh, before Christ, and, and maybe that's what the, the point is he's trying to bring to them here. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, that certainly is. There's an awful lot to it. The most obvious t uh, typology of in Joseph and Jesus is when he was put into the well and left for dead and then brought out uh, alive and become becoming the savior of his people. He was the savior of the uh, his father and his his family, and uh, what became, you know, Israel, and all these people were saved because of Joseph. And so, in the well and coming out is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection, and then being the savior of the people. So in that way, people will say that Joseph is a type of Christ. Uh, let me see. Uh, 
And so it says all his kindred, which is three score and 15 souls. So that's 60, that's 75. There were 75 members of his family. So you had uh, Jacob Israel, and I don't remember if his wife was, I don't think his, his wife was already dead and buried at that point. I remember that he had to make some deal for the land to bury his wife. Um, so uh, you had Abraham, you had uh, Jacob Israel, you had 11 of the 12 sons, only Joseph was missing, and then their families. And it came brought to a total of 75. And then what, from the time they get to Israel to the time they, I mean, from the time they get to Egypt and are embraced and loved by, by Pharaoh because they are the family of, of uh, Joseph, uh, to the time they left after 400 years of slavery, they, that, that family had grown to probably hundreds of thousands, if not a million. That was the big complaint of the Pharaoh was that they were, the population was growing too much. Um, so Jacob went down to Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over to Sikkim and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emmer, the father of Sikkim. Uh, but when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph, the same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end uh, that they might not live, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. So um, Joseph in this speech or sermon to his accusers, uh, I, would, uh, I would think that his accusers would probably be growing impatient because rather than just answering the, directly the charges against him, he starts killing the whole history of the people. And I imagine as he's going through this, they're, they're really getting upset, even more upset than they were, because he's telling them things that they don't want to hear about. But he's, there's a purpose in all, all of this. Um, all right, brother, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, I think it's well known uh, amongst the, uh, the Sanhedrin and the, the priests that uh, Stephen is talking to. Uh, the, the, again, back to the typology of uh, history here, uh, when Moses uh, came on the scene, uh, Pharaoh tried to kill all of the, uh, the children, the firstborn children uh, of, the, of the Jewish people. And of course, that's another typology to Christ. Everyone knows that King Herod uh, killed all of the, the firstborn, one to three years old or something, trying to make sure that the Messiah was, uh, was among the slaughtered. So uh, I think he's sticking their nose in the fact that uh, all of this had, was preordained and spoken of and shown in their history. And uh, they have become those that they would rail against uh, looking back to their own history. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this last portion that we've covered here in the Amplified, just so we can get um, hear how they express it. Sometimes they express it in a way that is really very helpful. So I'll start with verse nine. The ten elder patriarchs, overwhelmed with jealousy, sold their younger brother, brother Joseph into slavery in Egypt. But God was with him, and he rescued him from all his suffering and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made Joseph governor over Egypt and over his entire household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great distress, and our fathers could not find food for their households and livestock. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers, these, these are the Joseph's brothers, the sons of Jacob Israel, he sent our fathers there uh, the first time, and on the second visit, Joseph identified himself to the brothers, and Joseph's family and background were revealed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and invited Jacob, his father, 
and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all, and Jacob is Israel, it says Jacob Israel here. So it's, and Jacob Israel went down into Egypt, and there he died, as did our fathers. Those our fathers is referencing the, the twelve sons of Jacob Israel again. And from Egypt, their bodies were taken back to Shechem and placed in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Um, But, but as the time for the fulfillment of the promise which God had made to Abraham was approaching, the Hebrew people increased and multiplied in Egypt until the time when there arose another king over Egypt and who did not know Joseph, nor his history and the merit of his service to Egypt. He shrewdly exploited our race and mistreated our fathers, forcing them to expose their male babies so that they would all die. Uh, okay, so I... Now I'm a little bit ahead, go back to the KJV. Uh, uh, verse, starting with verse 20. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and, de and in deeds. Uh, so I'll stop there after verse 22. Brother? Well, I, I think, uh, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead or not. I'm, you know, getting a little confused here and there. Uh, again, I'm the student, you're the teacher, so uh, you can help me out here. But maybe what's going on, there's a reason for everything Stephen says. We know that. And so maybe uh, Stephen is uh, trying to get the uh, Pharisees to recognize that now they're under Rome uh, very much uh, how Moses, when he came, was under uh, the Pharaoh's wrath. And uh, they started out under good circumstance, and, and here we go. Uh, Moses, was, by the time Moses was born, they were in bondage. And by the time Christ was born, they were in bondage to the Romans. And uh, uh, where, where uh, the Pharaoh tried to wipe out tried to kill Moses by killing the firstborns, so did Herod uh, under the Roman rule. So maybe he's trying to get them to see the, the typology there. Uh, I don't think his purpose is to uh, demonstrate the typology, uh, even though it's a good point. It's, it is true that uh, we can see that. Um, why is he going through this? Uh, summary of all this history. Um, uh, obviously, he's going to make a point in the end. He's like connecting all the dots, and I think what he's going to his conclusion is at the end is that starting with Abraham and then ending with Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, is that Jesus is the promised one from Abraham, and showing how how it all went, and he's the promised one, and yet you rejected him, just like Peter kept on. You know, in all his sermons, he said, he's the promised one, you reject him, you had him killed, and uh, you, you killed the one that we're all waiting for. And uh, But the good news is, he's risen. Um, go a little further, um, in the KJV. Um, and... and uh, and when he was full 40 years old, this is Moses, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So he, he, he certainly was aware that uh, that was his family, that he must have been uh, told by his mother that, uh, not his mother, but his adopted mother, the, the Pharaoh's wife, uh, she must have told him that, you know, he, he was not from her. Uh, she didn't give birth to him. She just adopted him. And so he was aware that these slaves, these Israel people, the children of Israel, were, uh, uh, he, he was related to them. So 
and, and, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he was for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now, verse 25, I'll have to read that in the Amplified, but let me get your your thoughts on that. Yes. Well, you know me when I get the, when I get a hold of a piece of meat. You know, again, this this sounds more and more like a typology to me, and I'm not sure. I'm sure they weren't aware, but uh, uh, you know, it, Moses was thinking that uh, the people would recognize him as the one who would save them, and of course, they did not, and uh, and he was eventually banished. But uh, uh, just uh, one note: I do remember hearing. And I don't know if this is true or not, because it's from a sermon, not from uh, anything I can reference. That at the time of Moses, there was about three million Jews uh, alive at that time, and uh, and I think at the time of Christ, it was very, very similar. I did look up how many people traveled to Jerusalem for the Pentecost, and it was like a quarter million. But uh, that, those are my only thoughts, Luke. Um, well, again, your your um, your points. Uh saying that this is a typology of Christ, it certainly is true. Uh, I'm only disputing that that was uh, the intention of, of Stephen in the speech to to show it as a typology. And we see the thing is, I, I've said this so many times, but I think you know not everybody's seen every one of my videos, so it's worth mentioning again. Uh, there's a saying that the the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. So a lot of these things in the Old Testament, like the example uh, that we gave earlier, that Joseph was put into a well, which is, we can compare to Jesus being put into the tomb. And they left him for dead. I mean, at first they left him for dead, but then they, uh, they brought him out. Uh, that was their intention for him to die in the well. If it wasn't for, I think it was Reuben, was the one brother that, you know, sided with Joseph and wanted, didn't want him to die in that well, so they agreed to sell him to these uh, slave merchants. But when they put him in the well, we can look back and see now that this is a comparison to Jesus being put in the tomb, and Jesus came out of the tomb just as Joseph came out of the well, and Jesus now became our, uh, the Savior for all of mankind. Joseph became the Savior for the Israelites. And they, they were saved because of uh, his position of power enabled them to be fed and taken care of. Um, so the reason it says the Old Testament is New Testament concealed is back when those things were happening, they didn't put two and two together and understand the relation, you know, that we, the, the, the way that we see it now looking back. By the way, the end of that, that cliche, I guess I could say, is, is that the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, but the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So as we're reading all these things in the New Testament, we can say, whoa, look how similar this is. You can, can you see how this is like a type of Christ being death, burial, and resurrection here? But um, so we have the benefit of hindsight. So now we can, under, we can under, we understand the Old Testament better now than anybody did in the past because we have the benefit of hindsight. All right. Any more thoughts on that before I can? Well, that makes plenty of sense, Luke. I'm, I'm dying to see uh, how this turns out. You know, I mean, this is a, a speech being given by uh, Stephen, who must know his head's on the chopping block, and uh, and they're allowing, and he is uh, giving a history of the Jewish nation. Uh, and I'm dying to see how it all works together in the end. Well, that's an interesting point. Uh, does he know his head's on the chopping block? Remember, up to this point, there's never been a Christian martyr. I mean, we know that they've been put in jail for a period, short period of time, and we know that they've gotten beaten, but so far, they've never taken to the extreme of killing one of these uh, believe, new believers. So did he expect that he was gonna be killed over this? Um, I mean, every time Peter and John were brought in for, for trial, they always let him go. And maybe he, he just thought that they'd let him go. Uh, I, I don't know. 
So whether whether he expected it or uh, I, I really can't say. I don't have any clue. Uh, I'll read further now. Um, Oh, I'm going to read 25 in the Amplified because that verse wasn't clear to me in the KJV. It says, he expected his countrymen to understand that God was granting them freedom through him, assuming that they would accept him, but they did not understand. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. That's a that's a good point you made. I never really related that to Christ, but yeah, that's a very good, uh, that certainly would fit right in in the typology. And then verse 26 in the KJV, and the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? This is Moses talking to the Israelites. Uh, but, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian, uh, of, of Midian, uh, where he begat two sons. That's verse 29, the end there. Brother Joe? Yeah, that's kind of amazing. You know, uh, I, I didn't see that before. Moses uh, expected that his uh, newfound family uh, would embrace him as a, a savior and someone who was uh, coming to their their uh, benefit and instead they turned on him and uh, threatened to expose him to the authorities uh, for helping them. Uh, wow, <laughs> that's got to be a wake up call. It's a cold slap. Um, back to you, Luke. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm also surprised that uh, the. Uh, his 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 reaction was to leave the country and here he was a prince in egypt the, the like the adopted son of pharaoh he, he, and and uh, i mean he had he was i mean imagine the the life and and power and and position you're enjoying and and then because you murdered a uh, one of the soldiers, I, I guess it was one of the slave masters, uh, mistreated, and he hit him and killed him. And I don't think he intended to kill him, actually, but but he killed him. So it was either murder or manslaughter. And and so instead of him thinking that, well, hey, I'm a prince. If I kill someone, the pharaoh's not going to be too upset with me. You know, They're, the rules don't apply to the royal family, do they? Apparently they did. Uh, maybe he was afraid for his wife, brother. I, you know what? I just realized something, and I all, I've always said the same thing. You know why would Moses be afraid? Because he was a prince. You know he could have had twenty guards killed. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, I'm sure that that happened all the time, given the history of of uh, the pharaohs. But now I see the problem for the first time. I've never seen this before. He proclaimed himself to be uh, the king of the Jews or uh, the savior of the Jews. And rather than accept him, they threatened to expose him, not for killing the, the slave master, but for proclaiming himself to be this one that uh, Pharaoh certainly couldn't tolerate, someone that, that would, uh, was on the Jews' side. He's exposed himself not only as a Jew, but someone who could save them or lead them. And so that would have been a direct threat to the Pharaoh. Yeah. Uh, now, in this summary by Stephen, I'm not sure that um, we're getting it. If we had gone back and studied, because as I uh, actually, I never did Moses. I told you about all these character studies I've done. I, I stopped after. Um, um, let me see, I got uh, Noah, um, no, I got Abraham, I got Joseph, and then I think, um, hmm, 
I can't remember where I left off in the character study, but I know, oh yeah, I, I remember I went to um, do the study on uh, uh, Job. I got, because I didn't know where to put Job. When you study the, the history of, uh, where do these fit in the timeline of history? There's a great dispute over where Job fits in. Um, some people say he was bef lived before the flood. Others after the flood. Others say he lived. He was a contemporary of Moses. But um, so I decided to do Job, and he's the last character study that I, I did. So I need to. I haven't continued in that to uh, pick up with Moses. So I, I need to. When I go back to the character studies again, I need to go through Moses, uh, you know, carefully. But if I'm remembering right. Uh, I don't think this was part of the text of that at all that he had in mind that he was going to be their savior at this point. When he killed the guy, he's afraid, he runs and hides out, he has no clue at this point. Uh, so when Stephen is referencing back at this, um, he, he's, I don't think it's to be taken that Moses at the time, he murdered the guy or you know, killed the guy and then he's talking to them and there's say they're going to report him and he runs and hides out i don't think in his mind he considered himself that he's going to be the savior of the the the, the israelites at that time he had no clue until god revealed it to him quite a bit later yeah but you, you, you saw what the jews said i mean the the uh, fellow the captives in egypt they said who are you to be calling yourself our king or our ruler uh so he did have an inkling that he was uh, uh, going to be their savior, uh, and uh, he killed that guard on their on their behalf. Uh, and so, when they said, "Who are you to call yourself a ruler or or over us?" Uh, I think that he was in fear for his life because uh, here are the slaves saying, "This guy claims to be our king or our ruler." Yeah, but uh, why wouldn't he? He is a prince of Egypt. So I think they. I think they were referring to him as, uh, you know, a, a Jewish ruler, someone that was there to uh, advocate for them, is what it sounds like to me, uh, and that may have been uh, inspired knowledge. Maybe, maybe that it wasn't said before, and 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 God was speaking through him. I don't know. Well, if you're ambitious, you can go back and look at all that the verses and study very carefully this uh, in in the Old Testament where it's writing about these these things and uh, I might be wrong but I'm pretty confident that uh, uh, this was not part of the conversation at that time it was no indication Moses had no clue nobody had a clue that he was going to be the leader of the Jewish the Israelites he went off and got married and had children and then God called on him at that time but it was it was years later quite a bit later I don't remember how many years but year if not maybe even decades later he, he was quite a bit older than 40 when when he God revealed to him that you're going to go back and save the people but uh, it was no it, no clue that Moses had or this people that he were accusing him this is this is Stephen's uh, account of all these things but he's I don't think he's saying it in the, in the way that uh, in that it, basically he has hindsight he's using hindsight saying that uh yeah you're uh um, well who are you maybe maybe when if, if it does say that in the old testament uh maybe it's just the fact that uh the guy's ch challenging him because he knew he, and maybe they knew that he was not a born of, of, of pharaoh he was adopted maybe, maybe that's why they they were questioning his authority i don't know well, it was a well-kept secret that he was a Jew. I don't think anybody knew at that time. And uh, and I'm just reading verse 27, where uh, they say, who made you a ruler over us, uh, or, or a judge? But they did say, who made you a ruler over us? Uh, Wilt thou kill me as they did the Egyptian yesterday? So it looks like they're, they're aware that he is Jewish, and that uh, he can't, he could, he at least uh, appeared to them as someone who would be a ruler uh, in their behalf. So, I mean, when would a slave talk to a, an Egyptian prince in that continent? They'd be killed instantly. 
So they must have known he was a Jew. He must have told them or somehow the word got out. I don't think it was a slave. It was a slave that he was protecting. It was an Egyptian that he killed. Right, right. But it does say, uh, uh, who, who made you ruler over us? And will you kill me as you did the Egyptian? Now, if that was another Egyptian talking, uh, I would see your point. But this is saying... Okay. I got a homework assignment for you then. I want you to go back and read that portion of scriptures and, and, and analyze it carefully and uh, show me how um, that anybody at that time, Moses or the people that uh, uh, said, who are you, that anybody has any indication that he's going to he's uh, claiming kingship over as the king of the Jews. I don't think you're going to find that. I'm very confident you won't find that at all. But uh, a lot of times when you, when something happens in the Old Testament, even Jesus did this often, um, he's, he quotes something in the Old Testament, but it's not, it's not an accurate quote. He's paraphrasing it. Um, if you look at all the things that Jesus and, and uh, the, the apostles, when it, it says uh, the prophet said, or uh, you look at something and you say, oh, there's a footnote, and you realize, oh, that came from the Old Testament originally. When you, when you look at it, you see, well, it's very similar, but they're not quoting it exactly right. It's, it's very similar. All right, let me continue on. But uh, I would like for you, if you're uh, convinced about this, to uh, look at it very carefully and then show me if I'm wrong, okay? All right, let's, let's go on here. Um, verse 29, then, uh, then, Moses, then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Madian, where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were expired, see, see, this is, see, that's what I said, 40 years. He was 40 years old. Now he leaves, gets married. 40 years have transpired. He has no idea that this is God's plan for him during this entire time. It says, and when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. Um, so I think that supports my, my point that uh, Moses had no idea about any of these uh, plans of him uh, being the leader of the Israelites uh, uh, until 40 years later. All right, brother, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, are a lot like what you said when Christ would uh, talk about the Old Testament. He would make reference to things uh, about an event, but things that had never been heard before. I think he may have been speaking uh, uh, through inspiration of the Spirit, revealing things that, that were never known before. And uh, just maybe that's the case here, uh, but I don't know. I, I, I It's kind of... Uh, grabs me that Moses spent 40 years uh, in the wilderness or, you know, doing what he was doing uh, during those 40 years without any uh, notable communion or uh, communication with God. And then after 40 years, all of a sudden the burning bush appears, like right out of the blue. Like, okay, God says, okay, I think, you know, it's been 40 years. I think I'll start talking to Moses again. Uh, that kind of surprises me. Well, if it's one thing to be surprised about it. It's another thing to question whether that's that's the case. Do you have any reason to believe that it's not the case, that God is in front of that? I said any notable communication uh, because nothing else is noted. Uh, I, I don't know that he didn't have communion or communication with God, but uh, the burning bush caught him by surprise. And uh, so it was obviously not normative anyway, and uh, it was a miraculous event. And there's nothing else noted during those 40 years that I know of anyway, and that's not saying a lot. Uh, so it almost seems like God let him go through a dry spell for 40 years before he started communicating with him again uh, in any notable way. Well, to, to me, uh, to call it a dry spell means that you you were you had water, and then there was a dry spell, and then you got water again. 
at the, just to compare it to dry and wet. But there was no dry spell. From his birth until he was 80, he had no understanding or any knowledge about the God of Israel. And uh, this was the first first inner, first idea he had. Maybe he, maybe, and he knew there were these Israelites. There's no indication at all that he understood anything about their religion, their beliefs. Uh, he just knew that that was the family line he came from. So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think it's a big surprise that he's 80 years old and then God decides now, I'm going to, here's Moses, I'm going to use him for this purpose. Um, let me read on. Uh, uh, verse 31, when uh, the flame of fire in a bush, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Uh, let's just stop there for get your thoughts on those verses. Uh, well, I, 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 those are. I want to comment on that, but first I want to go back to verse twenty-five, if you would. I love a good challenge, and uh, verse twenty-five uh, said that for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them but they understood not so uh, that that would be uh in slight contradiction to what you were saying earlier and so i thrust that back uh, to your challenge and uh i'll let you answer that and then i'll, I'll come back to this point um well I'm not, I'm not sure that we should take that, that he supposed at the time it was happening. Uh, in, his, in his life, maybe years later, after he's Moses and he's rescued them and stuff, and stuff, he, he, he might have been surprised wondering why uh, it went that way and, and that uh, they didn't realize that he was trying to help them. But again, uh, this is Stephen giving a, 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 a recount, a summary of all this stuff, if you can find this same point and make this point from the actual scriptures in the Exodus, then show me. But um, again, I don't have Exodus memorized, but I'm 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 pretty sure that uh, uh, there's uh, no indication that he had the idea that he was supposed to be going to be the leader of these people at that time. So. Um, as far as that verse 25 is concerned, you have to go back and, and compare that to the conversation at the time in Exodus. And when you do that, if you, if you see that that supports it, then, then let me know. But I doubt that very much. Now, uh, now this idea of the burning bush and taking off your shoes, you know, things like that, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't begin to have any understanding of why you have to take off your shoes. Uh, he, he does tell him that uh, he identifies who he is. Uh, he's the, I'm the God of your fathers, you know, your ancestors. Um, see, now, I'm the God of thy fathers. Now, here's something that a lot of people don't understand. When it says father, it doesn't mean that, that your direct immediate father. It means that the, the genealogy going back grandfather, great-grandfather, and so on and so on. These people are all fall under the, can be uh, called fathers, even though if we're going to be more precise, we call them grandfather or great-grandfather. So I'm the God of thy fathers, even though he, he, you know, he's a long ways from in, in time from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, then he said to him, then said the Lord to him, put off thy shoes from thy feet. I'd like to see if you have any thoughts on that. I don't. I don't begin to understand why he has to take his shoes off. It's holy ground, he says. Yeah, that 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 I don't understand. Uh, I've got a friend of mine who uh, makes me take my shoes off when I walk into his house. I always thought he was a bit picky, but this is God talking. So, 
uh, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, uh, all I can think back is to the garden what, before they uh, they needed clothing and and wore no clothing and uh, it was holy. So I guess where God is, uh, uh, anytime you take a shirt off, like, your guess is as good as mine, Luke. I, I'd have to have to do study on that. I'm sure someone has, but I don't know it. Yeah, well, my guess is not as good as yours because I don't even venture a guess. But if you can ever come to my house to visit, I'm going to ask you to take your shoes off, but not because it's holy ground, though. Just because my wife likes it that way. It's holy carpet. <laughs> yeah. uh, verse 34. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of, thy, of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. Um, this Moses whom they refused saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which appeared to him uh, in, in a bush. So, but this is, um, again, this is uh, Stephen reflecting back to history from what distant past and saying that they they challenged him who made you a ruler and a judge but he's saying in fact god did god did make him but not at that moment it took 40 years later but god did um verse 36 he brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of egypt and in the red sea and in the wilderness four years uh, I'll stop after verse 36. See if there's anything you want to say about all that. Well, there's a, a definite, uh, Chris, that, you know, when you're always trying to uh, correct people, you know, and the messenger thing, you're quite right because this was obviously God. And yet uh, it, it speaks to the Christophany of me as him being an angel. So, uh, you know, that was, that was Christ, I'm sure, uh, who was making the appearance uh, to Moses in the burning bush. So the angel was, was Christ, I think. Um, so, uh, and it says, I, I noticed he said, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people. He repeats that twice. And I'm sure there's some significance there. Um, and again, I think Stephen may be speaking as the Catholics would say, ex cathedrally. I think he's, I think he's getting knowledge that, uh, in little bits and pieces that maybe uh, nobody knew before, but just an opinion. Because I was looking back at the scriptures at the angel part. Uh, and uh, so I asked you to make that point again in a minute. But uh, as, I, as I'm looking at this, I mean, it, it's clear that this is God speaking to him. It actually says it. It said, uh, uh, then said the Lord to him, and he said, uh, I've, I've, uh, uh, let me see. Oh, I thought there was another point where it said God. Oh, yeah, he says, verse 32, it says, I am the God of thy fathers. So this is verse 32 i mean it's god identifying himself to him and then later the word angel appears i hadn't noted that when i read it so let me look at angel okay verse 35 this moses whom they refused saying who made thee a ruler and a judge the same did god to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush Okay, so that's really, really, very clear. He's referred to as an angel here in verse 35, but it's clear. It says, I am the God of their fathers. So this is an example of the idea of God being an angel or the term the angel of the Lord, not meaning that it's a created angelic being, but it is God himself. And, you know, there's the, the term theophany and Christophany. Uh, theophany means that, that uh, this is an example of one where God appeared to men in some form, um, and that's a theophany. And if, if we consider it that it was specifically in the Godhead, 
Jesus Christ uh, appearing. Um, that would be a Christophany. So that would be a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. And there are many examples of that, I think. But whether it's a theophany or Christophany, Brother Bill coined a term. <clears throat> I've never heard uh, before. I don't think anybody else has ever said this, but he called it a, a triophany, where you have three three persons of the Godhead all uh, appearing to man at the same time. And the, the best example is the baptism of Jesus, where you have Jesus in the flesh and, the, and being baptized, you have the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove, the scripture says, and you have God the Father speaking, this is my beloved son. So this is a, not just a theophany, it's a triophany where all, all, part, all three persons of the Godhead are appearing to man, uh, you know. So I, I, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up about the angel. I hadn't really, I just, so it's just one of the things I just missed. All right, any, any more else before we go? Over? Oh, I was just thinking it's kind of neat when a couple of guys just sit down and do a Bible study. Uh, a lot of things that uh, you hadn't thought of or looked at before pop out at you. It's kind of neat. That's it, Luke. Yeah, that's to me, that's one of the great uh, benefits of studying together. Uh, you know, <laughs> one person sees something that the other person doesn't see, and it's just a great, uh, it's great to get that kind of uh, uh, sharing of our, our insights and you know uh, revelations I got a, I had a great pleasure yesterday one of my close friends here in Las Vegas I've known since about 1970 uh, he's really getting in bad shape he's a couple of years older than me but he's not doing well at all and my wife and his wife went out to dinner together and I so I went over there just to visit with him and we got into a long talk we talked for several hours and it was really interesting. It was probably two thirds of all of our conversations at that time was about the Bible. I mean, all I gave him like a big history of the Bible too. He had a lot of questions and interest in it. My wife said, was he interested in talking about the Bible? I said, Cindy, do you think I'm like keep talking to the Bible about the Bible to him for hours if he's not interested? You know, come on. He was interested, but um, uh, I was explaining to him that, look, I've read the Bible over and over again, and in parts of it, I've studied it, you know, in depth. And then sometimes, after many years, you, you get it. The light comes on. It's a revelation. And uh, he thought, he thought, immediately thought of the book of Revelations with an S. And I said, well, no, it, it's the book of Revelation. The revelation, not not yes, it's not a plural, and that's a very even a lot of people I know who are very knowledgeable about the Bible are always making that mistake, calling it the Book of Revelations. But I told him that well, I'm talking about a revelation where God reveals a truth to a to to a believer, and and I, as I said, it's happened hundreds of times in my life where I don't, I don't see something, and then at a certain point in time, after I've read the verse 50 times or 100 times, all of a sudden, God revealed it to me. I get it, and it's just it's such a joyful thing, and that's more likely to happen if you're studying with someone because you get the benefit of their revelations that he, sh he shared with you. All right, I'm going to go I make it a point uh, not to do any pre-study when we get together, Luke, right? You know, it's real tempting to see what someone else has to say prior to doing one of these Bible studies, uh, because if you don't, you run the risk of uh, looking stupid or or not having uh, a commentary where it would be helpful. But I just find that when I sit down with the Bible without uh, pre, maybe I've got my background, but without preconceived or or fresh insight from someone else that when you sit down and read it like a new first time you've read it in a while that you don't come in with preconceived notions and, and you you might miss big points that other people have found but you're more likely to find little things that other people haven't and so uh, at the risk of looking stupid sometimes that's just the way I enjoy doing it uh, when I get together with you well I just had a little revelation, and that is, I looked at I looked at the clock. I, I cannot believe it. I remember yesterday, 
was so strange. I, I told you I had a, I was pressed for time and I had to finish the study at, sharply at four o'clock so that I, I could leave with my wife. As I said, she was going to meet her friend for dinner. So I, I ended the, the discussion with you and Ted and myself, I ended it abruptly because I thought, okay, we've run out of time. I got to hurry up and leave. And then I realized that, wait a second, I stopped a half hour before time. I was mixed up on the, the time. And it was really interesting how that happened. But um, it probably was a good point to stop anyway, because we finished chapter six. And this way we can start chapter seven right at the very beginning. Uh, but today it's a different kind of a thing. I look up and I say, wait a second, have we really talked for almost an hour and a half now? I know you like to go an hour and a half if there's just the two of us. So we're, we're approaching the end. Um, and so, so I, I guess it's time for us to do sum up our thoughts and do a gospel message here. Well, I yeah, I, I'm kind of surprised too. Yesterday was funny. You, you couldn't see because I, I tend to turn my uh, camera off when I'm not talking so I can smoke my cigarette without looking bad or whatever. But uh, yeah, I got a, I had the biggest smile on my face when I realized what you were doing. But uh, I couldn't bring myself to interrupt. You were in, it was a good place to stop. But uh, yeah, I just, uh, time went by really quick today. But you know, I, I think I've seen a couple things that I'm going to challenge you on. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy with what we've done today. It may not have been helpful to whoever happens upon this as much as if I hadn't been a, a contrarian. But uh, I, I've been real happy with the study today, and I'm, I'm dying to dig into a couple things because of it. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. You know, this is, this is what God inspired Stephen to say to the rulers of Israel. We're going through it kind of an in-depth study, a lot more in-depth than I thought uh, in his in his speech here. And uh, I'm dying to see how it all fits together. Whatever it is, it didn't go well for Stephen uh, by the end of it, because he must have said something that yanked their chain. So uh, I'm kind of anxious to continue on. But uh, back to you, Luke. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I hope you will. Uh, I, I'd like to put the burden on you, uh, to prove me wrong because I'm, I'm operating based upon certain assumptions and my memory. Uh, but verse 25 is your, is your issue, uh, thinking that it's part of this typology and that uh, he's, uh, he, it, it's known at that time by him or, and, and that, uh, that he's, uh, he's either claiming or they're seeing him as claiming that he will be the king of the Israelites. And, uh, um, uh, what I'm saying is that from what we covered today, it says that uh, 40 years passed and there was no communication with God in his whole life. There's, we don't have any indication there's any communication from God at all until he's 80 years old. And uh, there's no reason for us to think that he was aware that God was going to use him to be uh, the, the king of the Jews. And he wasn't making that as a claim, uh, even though the way... Stephen has, has said this and it's recorded in the book of Acts. Um, it, I, I don't think it, it matches what you're going to read if you go back and read Exodus. But so if you find otherwise, I'll be very interested in hearing it. And uh, as far as the rest of the study as a whole, um, um, I thought I enjoyed it very much. Time really flew by, so I must have really enjoyed it. It was very interesting. A lot of, it, it, I've always loved the, the, uh, the, this timeline and uh, you know I, I memorized a long time ago uh, the, the prophecies there, there, there's a prophecy uh, specifically on each of these people um, that the, the Messiah would come from the family line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob Judah, Jesse David so um, in all of these characters Abraham and and his two sons, and then uh, Isaac and his two sons, and then Jacob and his twelve sons. And, you know, I'm I'm I, I know that material pretty well, and it's it, it's always fun to dis, to discuss that and all those characters. And when, as I said, when I did the character studies on all these people, all, all these main characters, all the way up through Joseph, uh, and then 
the one last one I did, as I said, was on Job. So those character studies, I really enjoyed a lot, but I really got to know a lot about all those characters because before I did that, I had a good general un understanding of it. But when you really get into the, as we're doing here, when you really try to really get into the, like the nuts and bolts of these verses here, you get, you understand it much better than you did just from reading over it over the years. So that was very beneficial. Uh, and now the, the the gospel message uh, we, we end each broadcast with, with them the word gospel is a greek word it means good news so i've got really good news for you now it's it's the best news you'll ever hear in your whole life if you really understand it and believe it you'll realize it's the best news and, and that is that uh, um, jesus is offering you right now eternal life in heaven as a free gift now, in other words, if, if you think that after people die, they maybe God judges them and they go to the good people go to heaven and the bad people go to hell and you're trying to be really good and hope you go to heaven. Well, you need to understand that that's not the way it works. Uh, not that's not the what I call Christianity that, that we find in the Bible. You, you've probably been misled by. Uh, you know, the churches you've gone to, the tel televangelists you've watched, the radio, uh, Christian radio. Um, most people are not taught biblical Christianity. Most people believe that in order to go to heaven, God judges them, and if they're good enough, they get to go to heaven. So what they do is they join the religions, they, they follow a set of religious rules, and they work real hard at it and keep their fingers crossed, hoping that when they go to that judgment and God says, why should I let you into heaven? They got all kinds of good things they can say and God will approve of them. But the truth of the matter is, if you were in front of God and he said, why should I let you into heaven? You better stop pleading your own case and saying that I deserve heaven for all the following reasons. Re reject that because the Bible says that's not the way to get into heaven. That's man's way. That's man's philosophy, but it's not the way to heaven that we learn from the Bible. The, the Bible says the way is Jesus Christ. It says that we don't get to heaven through our own religious works, our own ability to perfect ourselves and make ourselves acceptable to God. That's why the, the shirt here I have on today, it says uh, Christianity is not a religion. See, a religion, if I was gonna define a religion, you've heard the saying, well, they do something religiously, like that person exercises religiously. They never miss a day of exercise. Well, religion simply means that uh, there's a system of things that you're required to do in an attempt to earn approval from God. But see, Christianity is not a religion. It's not based upon the, what you do for God. Christianity is a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your savior and the belief that salvation is not based upon what you do for God, but what God has done for you. What did he do for you? Well, the Bible says God came down from heaven and became a man named Jesus Christ. It says that he became a man in order to die. And he had to die to pay for all of our sins, and he was successful. He suffered and died on a cross, paid for all of our sins. So now the issue be at you at the judgment is not sin because Jesus paid for all of our sins. The issue is faith or no faith. Did you put your faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, or not? The difference between the people in heaven and hell is not the uh, the, the good people are in heaven the, and, and the sinners, they're all in hell. No, all the people in heaven and hell are all sinners. We're all sinners. Some of us it's more obvious. Some of it is more secretive, not so obvious. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. The truth is not in you. So um, people in heaven and hell are all sinners. The distinction is not who sins and who doesn't. The, sin the distinction is who trusted Jesus and who didn't. So... Not only did Jesus die for our sins, paving our way so that we can go to heaven, but he also raised himself 
from the dead bodily on the third day, he promised he would raise himself bodily as a sign to prove that he is God and he is the Savior. So he gave us the proof that was demanded. Jews, the Jews demanded a sign. He said, this is the sign or the proof that I'll give you. And he did it. He is risen. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us that resurrection. And he promises that someday all of us, when after we die, someday there will be a resurrection of all of us. We will be raised back to life bodily and be judged. And the judgment will be, did you believe in Jesus or not? I hope that the judgment, when God, if God says to you, why should I let you into heaven? You don't argue your own righteousness. Instead, you say, God, I don't deserve it, but I've trusted Jesus. I'm relying on him. And if that's your, if that's what you believe, then the Bible says you're guaranteed you're going to heaven. All right, brother, uh, last word from you. Just a fantastic uh, gospel invitation. You know, it can be something as small as God. I know I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Jesus saved me. That's, that's, that's enough. And uh, I hope somebody says those words. Okay, brother. Thank, thanks again. I always look forward to it. Maybe, maybe tomorrow we'll do it again. We'll, we try to do these daily at uh, two thirty p.m. Pacific time, and uh, of course, sometimes our schedule won't permit it. But look for us at, at that time each day. Uh, thank you, brother Joe, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.